With most businesses going under from the shutdown of COVID-19 protocols, Amazon has made a $10.7 billion profit, a 56% increase with online purchases dominating the landscape of highways, airspace, and warehouse logistics centers. Due to the profound alteration of awareness through the advancement of technology and transference of information, non-places have become more seamless, ubiquitous, and further ingrained into the framework of our everyday lives without us even knowing. A non-place serves as a space of transience in which the human remains anonymous and space fails to hold enough significance to be regarded as a place. Today, non-places have become more necessary to understand, explore, and examine. From place to non-place, architecture's role in the acceleration of capitalism is an exploration into non-places, where architecture, or lack thereof, comes to fruition and defines infrastructural space, labor, and our daily life. Before we dive into the encapsulating realm of Amazon, let us begin by taking a look at the history of industrial typologies and see how architecture has played an important role in the shaping of industrial workspace over the years. We begin our timeline at the onset of the second industrial revolution in the mid 19th century with factory farming during which standardization, mass production, and distribution began gaining traction within the United States. These large farms that span hundreds of acres often handle the slaughtering, packaging, processing, and distribution of cattle, swine, and other animals. These industries were one of the earliest businesses to exemplify the industrial model of mass production and distribution. Henry Ford even accredited animal disassembly lines in the popular Chicago Union stockyards with inspiring the idea for his automobile manufacturing plants. While the factory farming business model and techniques served as an important element in mass production, the architecture involved in these farms were basic standard structures that lacked nearly any program or thought. The sheds that we see here in our first example were merely open rectangular boxes with minimal lighting and ventilation. Because of this lack of architectural program and design, these sheds created dangerous work conditions for the laborers as well as breeding grounds for animal cruelty and widespread disease outbreaks among the animals. Shortly after this moment, the brick mill building typology became more popular, popping up in cities all around the country at the end of the 19th century. With the creation of more jobs through these industries, hundreds and thousands of individuals would come to work every day to work unskilled jobs, and without the introduction of the conveyor belt and assembly line, the workspace was extremely crowded, unorganized, and chaotic. While in this instance we begin to see some more thought being put into the design of the workspace with slightly better lighting and ventilation through the placement of windows all around the building, these spaces still seem to only serve as a shell for the protection of the workers and machines from outdoor elements. There was still little thought given to the relationship between manufacturing operations and the internal layout, forcing the function of the building to follow the form. Since electricity was still a relatively new concept and uncommon within the workplace, the only lighting within the building entered through the windows. This forced the machines to be distributed on the perimeter of the floors, limiting the flexibility in designing a manufacturing process, as can be seen in the example of the Market Street Mill building in Iowa. Right around the turn of the 20th century, more mass production machines and strategies were integrated into the workplace, particularly the introduction of the conveyor belt and assembly lines that allowed for industries to expand their production output at unprecedented rates. This can be seen most clearly in Ford Motor Company productions, thanks to the assembly lines of the Union stockyards that Henry Ford decided to implement into his car making industry. Along with the huge increase in production came the need for buildings to be better suited for their industry needs. Henry Ford called upon Albert Kahn to design Ford's Highland Park plant in 1910 that allowed for ample space in the production of the Model T. Here, Kahn chose to construct the plant using reinforced concrete, which allowed for quicker and cheaper construction and also lowered insurance costs due to the fireproof construction materials. This also allowed the buildings to be built higher with larger and wider bays, as well as with larger windows to increase the natural lighting and ventilation within the building. Machinery can now be arranged in accordance to the sequence of production, and assembly lines greatly decrease the human circulation around the building and, in turn, the number of humans needed within the workplace. While reinforced concrete became the standard material for industrial factories in the United States for the next few decades, other designs and materials were being used in Europe, such as steel frame factories as seen in the AEG turbine in Berlin, designed by Peter Behrens in 1909. With the incorporation of a steel frame, structures were able to be expanded both in width and length. Due to the inefficiency of having to transport large machinery and products from floor to floor, as seen in the Highland Park plan, steel structures incorporated tall, single-story structures to maximize product circulation throughout the building. These tall structures also allowed for the building to be encased in glass, greatly improving the lighting and ventilation throughout the building. All in all, these architectural improvements increased throughput, extended the range of sequential operation, reduced travel and indirect labor, as well as reduced the number of workers in the workplace with more specialized skilled labor tasks. 
While the structural design of factories with tall, single-story structures would virtually remain the same, the only real change in these designs was an increase in size to hundreds of thousands of square feet. Aside from the scale of these structures, advancements in technology were the leading forces in altering the interior layout of the facilities that incorporated more advanced conveyor belt systems and machines capable of retrieving storage pallets in high places and transporting them around the facility. The example that we see here of an Amazon distribution center shows a standard warehouse layout that spans hundreds of thousands of square feet. Given the sheer size of these structures, these typologies have remained in more rural areas due to their need for massive amounts of land, creating places such as Ote Mesa that are comprised solely of warehouses and distribution centers, all of which are placed within close proximity of major infrastructural paths to hasten delivery transportation. Amazon opened its first warehouse in the late 90s when the company still had a specialization in books yet sold a small number of different products. Amazon launched Prime in 2005, subsequently ramping up sales and delivery. Amazon was still delegating a lot of its labor to other companies at the time, like other postal carriers and even renting slash leasing the warehouses they were operating out of. They had acquired many other companies up to this point, but most notably Kiva Systems in 2012. Amazon saw a need to heighten the efficiency of their own operations. When Amazon bought the company, they halted production for other companies to be used solely for their own use. Kiva was later renamed in 2015 as Amazon Robotics and acts as a first major turning point in Amazon's technological advancements. The robot successfully amped up efficiency 300 to 400% compared to the individual human labor while allowing Amazon to hold more stock in their centers. Amazon Robotics set the standards of the needs of the modern consumer by increasing efficiency, thus allowing the customers to up their demands. Today, there exists a disconnect between order fulfillment with the press of a button and the actual labor that goes into the process of fulfilling said order. The more the robots increase productivity and fulfillment, the higher the customer standards go up, and the harder the human laborers have to work to keep up. In 2014, about 15 years after Amazon moved into its first warehouses, Prime started gaining traction with its shorter promised delivery times and cheaper prices. Amazon changed its business model due to the changes in customer demands, mostly two-day delivery. They moved out of the central U.S. locations and moved closer to the customer. Phase 2 consisted of building their own facilities and occupying locations just outside of densely populated cities. Amazon was looking to buy property that was still cheaper than moving into the city, yet still had close proximity to infrastructural paths in the area. When Amazon buys property, their criteria list is small yet important. In every case, they are the only building in the lot and are adjacent to the nearest highway slash freeway. In this new model, more in-house Amazon components started appearing in more warehouses across the country. Through the standardization and the benefits of efficiency that coincide with creating a uniform workplace around the robots, just like the pallet in the 20th century, Amazon is revolutionizing the warehouse floor with universal standardization. With its programming and uniformity of their robotic fleets and surrounding components, in the 21st Century Fulfillment Center, the main components are machinery and robotics. The centers are being designed around these components while the human worker has lost their spot on the top of the design chain. This has profound effects on the human and their state in the workplace. The majority of space inside of Amazon's monumentally scaled warehouses is prioritized to the fleet of robots, which area is off limits to the humans to not interfere with complex algorithms and to minimize injury. This spatial phenomenon can be deemed as a human exclusion zone. This space within a non-place not only deprioritizes the human, but also makes them anonymous in their own workplace. Today, Amazon is working at an unprecedented pace in terms of rapid expansion. Amazon has exponentially grown since its start over 20 years ago. Today, the growth is nowhere near slowing down with Amazon acquiring and buying out smaller companies and frequently absorbing them into the main company. In the technological field, they are not only leading the way on the warehouse floor, but also exploring multiple paths to delivery, like drones, drone hives, underground warehouses, and other futuristic patents. In 2019, Amazon owned 2,396 patents and currently ranks as number 11 among patent grantees in the US. A small glimpse into the patents being filed can give us an idea of where Amazon sees itself in the future. The future is bright for the consumer, but the future is limitless for Amazon. With Amazon already making ambitious plans for the future, it is hard to predict what exactly Amazon will look like in 15, 30, or 45 years from now. But if there is one thing we know about history, it is that it repeats itself. That is, the non-place we see within the present-day Amazon Fulfillment Center will revert to a place that we once saw in the older industrial typologies before the infiltration of autonomous robotic systems. Out of all the patents that Amazon is currently filed for, we believe that aerial product delivery will be an efficient and practical method of delivery, and by the year 2049, Amazon will incorporate this method throughout many major U.S. cities with Amazon ISO. Here, we see an all-encompassing fulfillment center that rests not in non-places such as Ote Mesa, but in urban areas where populations are much denser. 
Amazon orders are more frequent to expedite the time of transportation. The fulfillment center facilities that we know today will become completely autonomous, ridding the human of any labor inside of them, to which they will be able to be placed underground directly connected to Amazon ISO. Here, drones will wait to retrieve packages ready to be delivered, transport them up through the central atrium of the building and into a designated slot at the top of the Amazon ISO structure according to the direction of their delivery destination. Surrounding the completely transparent central atrium are 10 floors of Amazon stores that offer a wide variety of Amazon products for one to come and buy in person. Through this design, the factory transitions into a spectacle in which the individual is invited into the Amazon facility and can see firsthand Amazon systems of logistics, a system that Amazon has purposefully hidden from the public in isolated areas for so many years. While on the surface, one may conclude that Amazon has transparentized its operations in an honest design for all to view in the center of the building, emitting the notion of convenience. And that is exactly what they want you to think. In reality, there is a cryptic truth behind the design through a snarky reference to Jeremy Bentham's infamous Panopticon that exhumes notions of social hierarchy and power dynamics. In other words, like the Panopticon, the central power is placed directly in the center of the building for all to see, in which their gaze is taken from one another and redirected onto the robot, that is, the thing that now holds power over all of us by the year 2050. The fact of the matter is that the power and influence that Amazon holds over the market and the socio-economic fabric of the country will continue to persist, exacerbating ways in which human privacy will continue to be encroached upon. And given Amazon's current day plans of continuing their dominance onto a global scale, there is nothing that points to Amazon slowing down, nor is there anyone that can hinder the trajectory they maniacally rest upon. The narrative that Amazon has created with its business model and fulfillment centers has proven that architecture has a profound effect on capitalism and its internal and overall growth.